had the opportunity to have a young person up here reading the scriptures and uh, the person who was scheduled to read the scriptures today wasn't available so I thought well I could do it myself or I could ask the most beautiful woman in the room to do it for me and so I did and so she will So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to seek him this morning in his word. Father God, we just thank you today uh, for your presence in our worship and your presence during our time, our called our family time of sharing things prophetically, of dedicating this little one. And Lord, just taking care of family business. And we thank you for that today. And we thank you now as we turn our hearts towards the word that you are going to fill us. And I believe the music that we did today, the... Uh, the songs that we did today were very appropriate to orient our hearts towards the uh, message we're going to hear today so that we're really receptive and really ready to hear what you want to speak to us through this chapter today. So we just thank you for it and give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, if you were here last week, we actually finished up a long study we've been doing on the book of Exodus. Dave Stabler did a great job of bringing that teaching, which means we're going to go into a new book. And the book is 1 John. So we like to teach out of the Old Testament, but also out of the New. And so we're going to be in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John for the coming weeks. And they're all short, so when we're finished those, we're going to go back to uh, the Old Testament and into the book of Joshua. In fact, the book of Joshua is kind of going to be our theme entering into our 40th year as a church as we celebrate the 40th year and go into our 41st year and so there's endings to things and there's beginnings of things and I saw this cute little picture I don't know how well you can see it here but it says that sometimes the end is the same as the beginning and there's this old gentleman in his wheelchair and this little toddler in his wheelchair and they're just kind of staring at each other like it ends the same way it starts doesn't it yes it does and actually this first letter that John is writing to us he starts off talking about the beginning so Laura if you read those first two verses what John says about the beginning what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us so it shouldn't really be a surprise that John starts off his letter with this idea about what was from the beginning. Because the thing is, uh, this letter is written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. Okay? And so when a writer has a certain viewpoint, it's going to show up when they write. It's one reason why we know that this letter was written by the same guy. Everything in this letter you're going to see as we move through it is going to echo the things that he says in his gospel. And so here's how John, he says what was from the beginning as he starts off his letter. Honey, read that uh, first, what he says in, in, in the first two verses of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now John's Gospel is different from the other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke overlap quite a bit. John doesn't. There are only a handful of things in John that overlap with the other uh, Gospel writers. He had a certain viewpoint. He had a certain way that he was trying to express things. And so it's not surprising that his letter starts out talking about the beginning and his Gospel starts talking about the beginning. But actually, you can take it one step further because I believe that what John was doing when he started out his Gospel, he was trying to say that what was at the beginning with Jesus is a reflection of what was at the beginning, beginning. And so he's actually taking that language from the book of Genesis, the very first uh, uh, verse in the Bible, which was? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you see, John used that. He knew that the, that the Bible started out talking about the beginning. And so he starts out his gospel talking about the beginning. And now he takes in his first letter he writes, and he's talking about the beginning. 
okay? And why is that important? Because we need to know that God had a plan in place for our lives from the very beginning of time. That plan that God had when he created the universe included sending Jesus to save the world, and it included you getting saved. Look what he says here in Ephesians 1.4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. So when did God choose you? Did he choose you today you got saved? Did he just wake up one morning and go, hey, I think I'm going to want to save you today. No, he already had decided to save you at the beginning. Before anything else was created, he knew that you would exist someday. He knew that you were part of his plan, and he knew that he was going to save you. See, he knew we'd be dedicating him today. It was part of his plan. And then he's got more parts to unfold. Now, now the thing is, I think that makes you pretty special. That God, the God who created the universe, had a plan for you from the beginning. Now, just like we saw this phrase in the beginning, John is taking it from his gospel, and he's reiterating it in his letter. Now, in verse 1 of his letter, he refers to Jesus as the word of life. Where did we hear that before? In his gospel, John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So once again, he's saying in his letter that Jesus was the word of life. In his gospel, he said, the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh. And now compare that what he says here in verse 2. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So what does that mean, manifested? It means it became real. So Jesus was the eternal word. He was the eternal life. And he became flesh. He became a man. He dwelt here on the earth. He was manifest. Did he always exist? Yes. But he wasn't always manifest here on the earth. But he came and he dwelt here as a man. He lived an earthly life. Now, how can we be sure of that? This is the important thing. Because John says, we've heard him. He says, we've seen him with our own eyes. He says, we've looked at him and touched him with our own hands. And this is important because John's saying, look, I'm not telling you something that somebody else told me. This isn't whisper down the lane. And I'm not getting the full story. I was there. I lived with Jesus. I heard him teach. I watched him do the miracles. I touched him. And John in particular was the only one of the disciples that was there at the cross. He said, I watched him die. And I saw him resurrected with my own eyes. And Peter is using a similar argument when he's trying to bring home a point in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majesty majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we are with him on the holy mountain. So Peter's talking about the man of transfiguration. And once again, he's saying, I'm not listening. I'm not telling you some cleverly devised tale that somebody said, hey, did you hear that one time Jesus was up on a mountain and he turned totally white? He's saying, I'm not repeating you a tale that I heard. I was there. I was an eyewitness. I heard the voice of God speaking from heaven. This is important because the people who are telling us about Jesus are people who knew him. And the fact that John actually says, I touched him, I touched him, is particularly significant when you realize that one of the reasons John was writing this letter, there was a point to this letter. There were some new Christians that had just heard about Jesus, and they were also getting a teaching that they were hearing called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was, oh, Jesus is great. But see, Jesus wasn't a real person. Jesus was like a spirit. Jesus was like an angel. He came, we thought he was with us, but he was more like an apparition. And John says, that's ridiculous. There's no way that he was just a spirit. I touched him. I was sitting with him at the Last Supper, and Peter asked me a question. I leaned back on Jesus and asked him, who is it, Lord? 
I held his dead body. Jesus was as real as you and me. So that's an important reason why John's writing this, to reassure them, no, no, don't let anybody tell you Jesus was just an apparition or a spirit. He was real. Now in verse 3, he says, there's another important reason why I had to write this to you. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship with God and a relationship with Jesus and with each other as believers is an important goal for John. He says, I'm writing to you because I want you to have what we have. Yes, you might not have seen Jesus or touched him the way I did, but you can have fellowship with him. You can be in a relationship with him the same way that we have a relationship. Now, this is important to John. Well, it should be important to John because it was important to Jesus. And John was Jesus' disciple. Look how Jesus prayed to his father concerning us in John 17, 21. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus is praying to the Father, when I'm gone, I want them to be in unity with us and with one another. We've got to be in unity, Jesus is saying. And then John is echoing that in his letter. He's saying, I want you to have fellowship with the Father and with his Son. And then in verse 4, John adds another goal. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. I'm writing this to you so you'll have joy, so that we'll have joy. That, and once again, this isn't just a goal that John had. Hey, let's all have joy. He's echoing just like he did about fellowship. He's saying Jesus wants us to have fellowship, and so I want you to have fellowship. And he's saying the same thing. Jesus wants you to have joy, and I want you to have joy. Because look what Jesus said in John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now, how are these two goals connected? John's saying, I write to you because I want you to have fellowship, and I, will, I write to you because you, I want you to have joy. Well, the reality is, is we have true fellowship with God. If we're in relationship with God, and we're in relationship with one another, the end result of that will be joy. We were never designed as Christians to live as the Lone Ranger, right? We've got to have other people in our lives. You can say, well, I have fellowship with God. That's good, but he, he designed us to have fellowship with each other. And you can see now that John's letter is uh, accentuating the same themes that he wrote about in his gospel. And now he does it again in verses 5 to 7. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So th this is a big theme of this letter. You'll see all throughout the chapters, there's a, a, a theme about light and darkness. And light is when we're, we're in fellowship with God, and darkness is when we're not in fellowship with God. And that once again, is this something that John, for the first time, is bringing up and he's never even thought of it before? No. This is exactly what he said in his gospel, in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, when he said this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So darkness is those who were not getting who Jesus was, and the light was those who could receive Jesus for who he was. And we see it again in John 1, 9, when he describes Jesus this way. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. Now, this emphasis on light and darkness, okay? It, we're going to see John bringing out more of what that means for our lives. But let's stop for a minute and realize the letter is somewhat echoing the gospel. What's the gospel echoing? Who was paying attention? Genesis. Okay, so go back to Genesis. Genesis 1, 3 and 4. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. 
So all John's doing here, and he's, as he's writing his gospel, and he's writing his letters, he's taking the basic themes of the creation of the universe, and he's saying, this stuff is still true today. And it was manifested through Jesus. Light was good. Darkness was bad. God separated the light from the darkness. And we need to know that Jesus is the light. So this contrast is that Jesus is the light that has come to shine in a darkness of a world that has rejected it, God and been separated from him. And now John's saying, you have a choice. Here's a choice. You either walk in the light. It's there. The light is there for you to walk in. You either walk in the light and you come to Jesus and you open up your heart to him or you just keep walking in darkness. And according to John, walking in darkness isn't just walking in sin. It's denying that you have sin. So look what he says in verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, the conflict between light and darkness is basically linked to this. Those who practice the truth, okay? Now, what does it mean to practice the truth? Basically, it means this. You admit that God is right. Right? God is telling you that this is the right way to live, and this is the wrong way to live, and when you practice the truth, you, you admit, God, your way is the right way, and you're actually also admitting, I haven't always lived your right way. That's practicing the truth, is to say, God, you know better than I do that I needed to be saved. But... Those who say, I don't need a savior. What? I'm not that bad. They're denying that they need a savior, and they're essentially, according to John, they're calling God a liar. God says that we need to be saved. If we say we don't need to be saved, then we're saying I'm right and God's wrong. That's not good. Now, one thing that's important when we look at these things that John says about sin and light and darkness is this. The simple reality is that even believers, followers of Christ, sometimes still sin. Now, I know that's earth-shattering, so I'm going to let that sink in. I, I heard that collective gasp. <gasps> what? Yes, it is true. We all do sometimes sin. And as we go further in this letter, we're going to talk a lot about the difference between what it means to occasionally sin and those who what John will use the term practice sin. But for now, we know this. The good news is that there's a cure for sin. And the cure is confessing our sin and being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And it's continually available. It's an irrevocable gift that's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. Because guess what? For the rest of our earthly lives, occasionally, hopefully less and less, we're going to miss the mark and we're going to do a little sinful thing. Okay? But Jesus paid the full penalty for all of our sins. And so every sin we've ever committed or ever might commit in the future can be forgiven and cleansed through the blood that Jesus shed, no matter how many times we do it. And we see the importance of shed blood in Hebrews 9.22. Mm -hmm. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is a flat-out biblical principle. And in the Old Testament, the people understood that. The whole sacrificial system, it was a shedding of blood of a goat, a sheep, a lamb, a bull. And that was to provide a covering for the people's sins. And if they went in and did that, they were covered. And their sins were forgiven, at least for the next 30 seconds. Until they went out and got mad at somebody and sinned again. Okay? So then th this process had to be repeated over and over and over because it only could give them a limited and temporary covering for their sins. But we're not under that covenant. We're under the new covenant where the blood of Jesus had paid the full price and the complete penalty for sin. And that's why Hebrews 9, 27, 28 tells us this. And in as much as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. 
Jesus got sacrificed once, and that's it, once and for all. Covered it all, all of it. And that's why in the middle of two verses, verse 8 and verse 10, which are saying, if you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. And if you say you're not a sinner, you're calling God a liar. But in between those two is this beautiful truth, verse 9. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the only thing that we need to do when we've stumbled on our journey. It says, if we confess our sins. Now, here's the thing. The word if is conditional, okay? You say, oh, well, won't God forgive me unconditionally? Well, you don't have to do anything to earn that forgiveness, but you do have to confess it. That's the if. Because why? Because if you don't confess it, you're not practicing the truth. You see? Practicing the truth and walking in the light is admitting, God, that thing that I did, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend it's not. It's wrong. I shouldn't have done it. That's what confession is. It's agreeing that God's way is better and that I messed up and didn't follow his way. But that's all that's involved. Just confessing it. It doesn't involve penance. Okay? All of us ex-Catholics voting around here, no Hail Marys, no Our Fathers, no nothing that has to be done. I just confess it. That's all. No retribution, no punishment, no, oh God, this week I'll try really hard to do better than I did last week, and maybe at the end of this week you'll like me again. No. The instant that we confess, we're, we're covered, we're clean. And I think just confess it. That should be Nike's new slogan. What do you think? <laughs> Just confess it, man. Move on. Because that's how wonderful it is. That's how God's forgiveness is given to us as soon as we admit our need for it. Instantly. It's not based on anything we've done or anything we can do. We can't earn it. It's given freely by grace. And this gift carries with it a total purification from unrighteousness. Total. Once we've confessed what we've done wrong, God accepts us and sees us as righteous. It's like the minute those words come out of my mouth and we say, God, you were right. I shouldn't have done that. I did it. Uh, you're, it was wrong, and I'm sorry. We may think that we're standing there looking awful in front of God, and instead, the instant we confess it, we're cleansed. And he looks at us and goes, well, you're fine, man. You weren't fine before you said it, but you confessed it. That's how quick it is. You're cleansed. You're forgiven. And here's the thing I want you to understand. If we're going to believe God, if we're going to walk in the truth, and we say the truth is saying that God is right about me, and if I say part of the truth that God is right about me is that when I've sinned, I go to him and say, you were right. The thing that you told me not to do, I shouldn't have done but I did it, and I need to be forgiven. I'm walking in the truth when I say that. But I also need to be walking in the truth that after I've said it, I can say to myself, I'm righteous and cleansed. Because if I don't do that, I'm not walking in truth. Because God sees me as righteous and cleansed. And if I say, oh God, you know, I confessed it, and I know you forgave me, but I know you don't, you know, think as highly of me as you used to, and this and that, we're calling God a liar. Walk in the light. The light is that when you confess, you are new money. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. You start fresh. There's nothing to beat yourself up about. The, the preacher D.L. Mooney said this, and I love it. He said, the voice of sin is loud, but the voice of forgiveness is louder. You see, because there's, there's going to be that voice. It's going to scream in your ear, yeah, but... What you did, that was really bad. And it might be you screaming it to yourself. <laughs> but the voice of forgiveness says, yeah, but confess it. And it's done with. And you've got to let that voice be louder than the voice that's telling you what you did wrong. That's what the Apostle Paul's talking about in Romans 5.20 when he says this. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Listen, there may be periods of, of your Christian walk. I'm not, you know, people say, well, I did a lot bad when I was a, a sinner when I, before I came to know Christ. Well, that's true for all of us. But we also still sin when we're Christians. And you may have gone through a period where it says here, sin increased. 
Hello? Sin increased. Like you just fell into a bad slump in your Christian walk. And next thing you know, you're doing like a lot of stuff like you used to do. <laughs> but when sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's what we have to understand, how God views it is. You get, you're falling into a little slump of sin here. I got plenty of grace for that. Just confess it. Come on. Just confess it. Get clean. We got to get on with this walk. So let me tell you something. I'm going to say these phrases. I want you to understand that as I say them, they are lies. I'm going to speak some lies up here, but I want to identify them so that when you hear them, you can go, oh, yeah, that's a lie. Lock it in. It's a lie if you ever hear this voice inside yourself. God is fed up with your sins. It's a lie if you ever hear this voice inside of yourself. You've used up all your forgiveness. It's a lie if you ever hear this voice saying to you, don't even bother going back to God again. He's done with you. Those are lies. And you don't want to walk in the lies. You want to walk in the truth. The truth is this. God's capacity for forgiveness is limitless. It is boundless. And it is endless. If you've been struggling with something, if you have felt like, boy, I just would never get my relationship with God right after this or that that I did, let me tell you something. Today, just confess it. Just do it. Get clean again. There's no reason to hold on to something like that in your life one more day. You can confess it, and you can let him cleanse you all over again. I'm going to close this with a song here, and uh, Laurie's going to look at the prophetic uh, words for individuals as we get ready to go to altar ministry here. This song you may have heard before, uh, not in this version maybe, but it's a song from, that's been on popular radio, and um, it's a nice song. I don't listen much to popular radio, um, nothing against it, I just, it's not what I normally listen to. But I went and listened to this song in its original version, because it's a really nice song. Uh, for those of you who are fans of his, this is a song by Ed Sheeran, and it's called Perfect, but uh, somebody rewrote the lyrics because the real love, the real perfect love is Jesus' love. I found the truth for me willing to dive right in and follow your lead I found a hope beautiful and sweet I always knew this was something waiting for me I was so lost till I found your love not knowing who I was but you've never given up on me your kindness just lets me grow your heart is all I want and in your eyes you're holding mine now I'm dancing in the dark safe within your arms I'm wiser from my past and you've become my favorite song even though I was a mess you have still given me your best I don't deserve it your grace is perfect tonight well I found a man stronger than anyone I know you are my peace my joy my promise you are my home I found the love to carry more than just my secrets when I am weak you carry me and call me your own I was so poor till I found your love fighting against all odds I know that I'll be alright cause you're mine 
heaven is holding my hand you're my world and my best friend and i see my future in your eyes now i'm dancing in the dark safe within your arms i'm wiser from my past and you've become my favorite song i have faith when i can't see because i know one day we'll meet in person it'll be so worth it no i don't deserve it but your love is perfect tonight Father, we just thank you for the perfect love of Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that allows us to be new and whole. And at any moment when we've slipped and fallen short of your standards, to get right again instantly, to move on cleansed and whole and pure in your sight, not beating ourselves up or allowing anybody else to beat us up, just to confess it and to move on. And we just thank you and praise you for that in Jesus' name. Now we have a prophetic word that came forward this morning as we prepare to open up the altar. Just as a reminder, the basket is for the words that are personal, not to the whole body. So uh, this is saying that this is recent, happening now. The door is right there. You are ready to step through, but you step back each time for one reason or another. This is a real feeling of fear. Someone who has been through the door and then turned and walked away, unbelief. This person is a middle to an older woman. So if that word is for you, come on forward and we'll pray for you about that. If you need healing for anything, if you need to confess anything, if you need just to be in the presence of the Lord, the altar ministry team will be here. Come on, let's get some ministry done. <laughs> 